Let's imagine you were immortal. Now let's imagine you spent one million dollars every single day for 2,000 years, then another 400 years, then another 80 years, then another 16 years, you would still be over 80 billion dollars short of spending one trillion dollars. Now let's imagine global debt was 272 trillion dollars. Well, that last part is far from imaginary. So this issue about how do you resolve the question of the debt, how do you make the transition to a new system, I think is enormously important. And I haven't thought my way through it. The only point that I do know is that moments of transition, whether it be regulation or other changes in the system, are always enormously dangerous. Moments of transition are certainly very dangerous. If only we had a military intelligence psyop to make that transition smoother. Hypothetically, of course. Your question really comes down to, can the government print enough money, whether electronically or, or in terms of just physical currency, to come up with $200 trillion? It can't without producing hyperinflation. That's a tried and true uh, st a statement. Uh, we had 20 hyperinflations in the last century. I hurt myself today. So we're leaving a bigger problem to our kids because this $200 trillion problem is getting bigger by $6 trillion a year. That's the true deficit. So that's going to require real structural changes, real damage to some generations over others, you know, real sacrifice, and we're not t discussing that. And this is why the country, our country is heading to, to second-rate status through time because we're not really dealing systematically with the long run. Um, we've seen underdevelopment, inequality rising and economic and political dependency. You could even argue that the Washington Consensus has not enhanced but prevented development and replaced the colonial system with its economic equivalent, which would explain why suddenly, when countries were decolonialized, it was decided, oh, we need development economics, and here it is, and this is what it does. Particularly, many countries have suffered from, well, the opposite lack of development, a uh, high degree of inequality, um, the problem of substantial indebtedness, corporate but particularly sovereign national indebtedness um, of a nation to other external lenders. Economists have been amazed that money seems to have been flowing from the poor countries to the rich but theory says you know the rich countries should be investing in the poor countries uh, but the facts are there has been a consistent outflow of total funds if you net them out uh, from these countries why is that what are the mechanisms developing countries it was found have a low savings rate what can they do ah the advice was we can give them savings we can lend them money. And the international banks were right on the heels of the IMF and the World Bank ready to lend. And this is what happened. And so a lot of uh, borrowing was done by developing countries from international banks. This foreign lending trick makes developing countries dependent. Their assets and resources often become the collateral for these loans. Moreover, their currencies tend to weaken over time compared to developed countries. This means that their foreign debt in domestic currency terms goes up and they have to service this debt with compounding interest. And we can clearly see why there is a net flow of money from poor countries to rich. Of course, the offshore infrastructure, which is also owned by the developed countries, allows corrupt officials in these poor countries to hide their stolen wealth. In, in developing countries, the offshore system of tax havens has facilitated the looting of these countries by their elites. Um, it has enabled them to take the money or, you know, steal the money and keep it safe somewhere else. And the looting of countries and corruption that is involved in this kind of process has been a significant driver of conflict. It's worth emphasizing that the banks, of course, just create this money out of nothing anyway. Um, in fact, there are no international capital flows, strictly speaking. Money doesn't flow in our modern banking-based system, um, and money is created by banks, which developing countries 
can and should use for their own development and for their purposes, whereas the foreign lending makes them dependent. And so you realize this entire borrowing from abroad is effectively, well, you could call it just a con. It's not needed. The foreign bankers just create the money out of nothing, which is what the developing countries could do themselves to create the investment um, and the domestic growth. Were the community banks doing this? No. In fact, these developing countries have been told how to set up their banking system, decentralized with local stakeholder community banks. This problem would have never happened. All right. It's the big international banks that did this, and that's why we do need to distinguish between the big bad guys and the good local guys. It is, you know, that complicated that we have to distinguish between them. Thank you. Okay. What have I become? My sweetest friend Every coin I own Just gets bogged